Good morning, everybody. So as Magda said, today's webinar is on cost-benefit analysis in the context of the energy infrastructure package. And here is what I prepared for you. So the outline of this webinar is first to discuss the importance of cost-benefit analysis in the package, then to talk about the process towards a single CBA method for electricity infrastructure projects. And these two parts should take about 20 minutes, as Magda already said, which gives us more time for the third part, which will be just a Q&A. Okay, let's start. So what about the importance of the cost-benefit analysis in this package? First, remember that the existing EU policy on infrastructure was the 10E uh, uh, networks program. So it's a trans-European networks program. And what it did is that it already focused uh, EU policy on certain priority projects. These priority projects have had different names, different labels, like projects of common interest, priority projects, and also projects of European interest. About 550 of these type of projects have received such a label, and uh, 42 of them have received the label which was more exclusive, which is projects of European interest. So what changes now with the new package? Well, you should know that in the new EU policy, we will have a focus on projects of common interest. So this label is not new, but what is new is that cost-benefit analysis will be used to select projects that will receive this label. Moreover, there will be newly established regional groups in which you have a decision body of European Commission together with member states that will receive uh, projects that candidate to become a project of common interest. So promoters will submit their projects together with a CBA analysis to these regional groups. And then projects will be compared and ranked. And eventually these regional groups will submit a regional list of projects of common interest to European Commission who will then adopt a single list of these projects. Okay. <clears throat> What else did we have in the existing EU policy? Well, remember that we already have indicative planning at European level, which has been introduced by the third package. Indeed, in the third package, you have this concept of a 10-year network development plan. And what it does is to bring together all projects that are being planned at national level to check if they are consistent and to improve coordination among these projects. Now, what is new in the package? is um, we will still have this 10-year network development plan, but there are several enhancements. Indeed, this package also amends the third package. Um, one of these enhancements is that for the development of this 10-year network development plan, the same CBA method will be used as the one that will be used to select projects of common interest. Okay, so already we see that the importance of CBA is not only for projects of common interest, but also for this 10-year uh, network development plan. And what's more? Uh, well, let's have a look at the existing EU policy to accelerate priority projects. So in the past, we had um, these gentlemen, Mr. Van Aertsen, Mr. Milcharski, Mr. Adamovic, and here uh, our very own uh, Mario Monti. Now, what these gentlemen have in common is that they have been European coordinators. So they have been asked by European Commission to accelerate certain projects. In the case of Mario Monti, this was the interconnector between Spain and France. And indeed, the general feeling is that this is a useful intervention. So the new package still has European coordinators, but there is more to accelerate priority projects. There is something on... Uh, permit granting, there will be now a first step towards a national uh, one-stop shop for permit granting and also a procedure with deadlines. What more? Well, there is something on cost allocation. So not only will we have uh, more focus, we will have more acceleration of projects through cost allocation. And again, we see in that procedure, which involves national regulators and possibly also ACER, that these decisions will be uh, based on cost-benefit analysis. Okay, what is last is that, of course, the existing EU policy also included EU funding for this type of projects. And in the past, we had mainly grants for feasibility studies and about 200 million per year. In the new policy, we will have this Connecting Europe facility. 
And if you look at the, that facility, it not only includes more money, we are not talking about more uh, order of magnitude of billion over the period 2014 and 2020. Uh, we also have new innovative financial instruments. There is a, a, an, an initiative on project bonds. Uh, and also what is new is that we will have a kind of one-stop shop for EU funding. So if you would apply for EU funding, you have one facility to go to. Okay, so clearly cost-benefit analysis is very important in this package. So then it's also very important that we have a good method to use for doing this cost-benefit analysis. And that's why the second part of this webinar is focusing on this. First, you should know that if you look at the package, there is an official process uh, described in there that will lead to the adoption of a single cost-benefit analysis method for electricity projects at European level, which means that all project promoters that would like to become a project of common interest would have to use this uh, single method. Now, of course, the method starts with a proposal that will be made by ENSOE, and I read this morning the package for you, which has just been published last week, and it says that ENSOE will start making this proposal in November this year. So six months more or less after the adoption of the package. Then ACER will have three months to give an opinion on that proposal. Next, you have a three months process whereby European Commission and Member States can also give uh, their opinion. Then ENSOE is asked to review its method and to possibly propose uh, an improved version. And finally, you will have the adoption of a method by European Commission. Now, what is good to know is that European Commission has been very proactive on this topic. So, in fact, Florence School of Regulation has already been contributing to this uh, infrastructure package since more than a year, with first a workshop being organized by our director and Jean-Arnaud Vinois in Brussels. And then we also got involved in this specific topic of cost-benefit analysis method, working with the unit of Katarina Zico Magni, and later also with Kitty Nitrai. And what the European Commission has managed to do is to encourage NSUI to come with a draft proposal. Already they did in September, an improved version in November with a workshop. And as you can see here, um, finally, the current proposal is the version of December 2012. Now, this has allowed ACER to already come with its own, uh, you could say, proactive position on that draft method, and it has allowed us also in the context of the THINK project to work on this topic, not coming with our own, uh, let's say, more academic method, but to simply suggest some improvements to what NSOE has already proposed. And if you read our report, you will see that we are quite positive. We, we really think that what NSOE has proposed already is a very important step forward, while here and there, of course, we still have suggestions for improvement. Now, before I enter into that, let me give you an idea of all the issues we have covered in our report. Now, first, if you want to develop a method on cost-benefit analysis, we have to think about what is the scope of the analysis. How are we going to define a project that we analyze? How are we then going to define a baseline in which we are going to test this project? Which are the effects we will look at? How comprehensive will we be? And how do we take into account distributional issues besides the pure economic effects? Once we have decided that, what you need to do is to see how we are going to calculate the net benefit, uh, cost and benefits corrected. Now, calculation is about quantification, but it can also include monetization. Uh, then, of course, we are talking here about projects that have costs and benefits according to a, a certain time period, so we need to discount it. And uh, for especially in this context, we have a lot of uncertainty. So it is very important that this calculation takes proper account of uncertainty. And you will see that we go through all of these issues step by step in the report. Um, and of course, we can rely on the fact that cost-benefit analysis is a very well-established uh, economic instrument used in many domains. What we have done is to look at all these experience and all these, uh, uh, yeah, all these practice we have in other domains and to see what it implies for electricity. So if you would think of what we really did, basically it is a kind of ABC of CBA. Now I do not have time in this webinar to go through the whole ABC, 
but I would like to highlight a few issues. And before doing that, I would really like to know what you think. So one of the very important decisions to make on the CBA method is will we monetize all the relevant effects or do we think that is too difficult and we should not do that and it's better to have a multi-criteria analysis so we have several indicators that give an uh, indication of the costs and benefits and based on that we can make a better decision. Now, to know what you think on these two issues, on these two choices, I will first open the poll here. Okay, and I will give you some time to answer. Okay, half of you have already voted. That is going very quickly. I'll just wait a bit more. Yes, okay, very nice. Thank you for answering so quickly. Let me then close the poll and share the results with you. So, as you can see, 41% um, of you is saying that we should monetize all relevant effects, while the majority, almost 60%, thinks that it's better to go for a multi-criteria analysis. Okay, that is very interesting. Let us now discuss what our research says about this topic. So I will hide this poll and we go back to the slides. Okay, so first, um, let me tell you what we did. So we started by thinking about what are all the relevant effects we are talking about here. And then you can see that there are three layers of effects. Of course, if you add an infrastructure project to an existing power system, you will have effects inside the power system. Then there is a second layer of what we call externalities and a third layer of macroeconomic effects. Then the next step for us was to think about, okay, how can we categorize inside these three layers the different effects? Then for the power system, obviously you of course have the costs of the infrastructure itself, and then benefits we categorized in three. On the one side you have on production, you have of course consumption, and then something we called other uh, market benefits, and they include things like improved competition or improved liquidity. Then externalities, of course, we know that uh, if you add uh, new infrastructure, it can change emissions because it changes production patterns. It can also uh, change uh, how, how much we get uh, renewable energy out of an existing installed capacity. Um, early deployment is all about using innovative infrastructure uh, technologies. So indeed, th this can also be an effect. You can have spill positive spillover effects on, on technology development. And, of course, not to forget, is that you can also have very local effects, both environmental and social costs. Then macroeconomic effects, what you should think about is jobs and economic growth. Then the next step was for us to think about, okay, which of these effects should we really um, take into account? And then we came up with this conclusion. Let me just um, give you a brief uh, steps how we reached this. Well, first, these two effects are important to consider. So why did, do we think we do not have to consider it as a separate effect? Well, if you think about CO2 emissions, we do have already European policy. We have a European carbon market with a carbon price. Of course, we can discuss whether this price is high enough or not, but that is a discussion of uh, assumptions of the baseline. The idea is that once you have a carbon price, um, the production cost savings already take into account this externality. Um, the same or similar for renewable energy. We do have renewable energy targets. So that means if you add um, uh, an infrastructure project, it might result in less spilling of renewable energy. So it changes the costs you make to achieve a certain target. So again, this is already included um, in this production cost savings effect. Uh, then on the other side here of, of the circle, you have first a local environmental and social costs. Also here, we already have regulations. Um, of course, uh, project promoters have to do environmental impact assessments. And as a result, they will already do some mitigation. There are some requirements to take into account. So that means that these effects are at least partly internalized in the infrastructure costs. Here, we did see that there are things like visual impact that are typically not yet included. So that for some particular projects where this visual impact is really a big issue, we might need to analyze this effect separately. The same here, we do already have uh, support for innovative projects, but you could have 
very innovative project that did not yet receive a lot of support, so that this effect also would need to be uh, considered separately. And the same here, I mean, for most projects, you could have uh, similar uh, mark other market benefits like liquidity and competition, while in, for some, think of a project in an isolated area, you might need to look at this separately. Um, so, in conclusion, we have these uh, three effects that we think should be looked at for all projects, and then you have these three here that we need indicators to know where we have a project where we need to look at this separately. And the others, they could be um, not considered. So then we also said that it is very important to, to monetize all these uh, effects, but I will come back to it later, why? Let me first share with you that what most of you think would be the best approach is actually what NCOE did propose in uh, December 2012, which is a multi-criteria analysis. And here you have the illustration of it. So this is what NCOE has in mind. As you can see here, there is part of it that will be monetized, and here, the costs and the social economic welfare. And then there are other effects that NCOE would prefer not to monetize, but to, to quantify and to give additional indicators for. So why, why did we not uh, um, think that this was the best approach? Well, let me give you one example. Imagine that this would be done by all project promoters and the regional groups that would then have to compare these projects and rank them would receive these tables for lots of different projects. And let's uh, simplify into two projects. So here we have two projects of common interest. All, both are candidating to become a project of common interest. One has mainly a monetized net benefit, while the other has lower monetized net benefit, but scores relatively high on these indicators. So what the regional group will then have to do is to decide whether this project will be ranked higher than this one. If they do, it would imply that implicitly we are monetizing these indicators and we are deciding that they are higher than this. So if you have a lot of these decisions, where a lot of implicit monetization is being done, and you could derive from that what is actually the monetization that has been done of these indicators. So we think that it would be better to, to, to do it explicitly. It's, we cannot avoid it when we rank projects that we monetize implicitly, so better to do it explicitly so it's more transparent and we can have a better discussion on how to improve this uh, explicit monetization of these projects. Okay, so that is actually the main um, suggestion of our research, the main recommendation for improvement to what uh, NCOE has proposed. But there are many more, and maybe this can inspire us during the Q&A. And now I would just like to very briefly introduce you to these recommendations. Well, first, as you can see, recommendation 4 and 10 is the ones I already presented. Now, the first recommendation was actually on project interaction. We do know that this is very important, and it's very important to take into account. Um, while we had some um, suggestions to improve it on what NCOE currently proposes. Regarding data consistency and quality, what NCOE proposes is to follow the current practice in the 10-year network development plan, and uh, we, we consider that this is fine. Then NCOE is already thinking of using the conventional time horizon, so this is also fine. Uh, regarding distributional concerns, we did have a remark, because the current proposal is to use um, discount rates that are proposed in the EU regional policy guidebook and actually we, we observed that this would imply that you would increase some distributional concerns because it would imply that projects from countries uh, that are under development more um, would be ranked lower than projects in developed countries. This is due to the use of social discount rates. So here we recommend it to, as you will see later, to have a single uh, discount rate that would be used for all projects uh, in Europe. Then regarding the infrastructure costs, we observed that uh, NCOE already has a list of items they want all project promoters to take into account, and we emphasized it would also be very important that these items are reported separately um, to have more transparency. Then also very important is of course the model that will be used to monetize all these effects. Um, here we do agree that there is no perfect model, so it's not necessarily good to impose one at EU level, but 
um, and so we propose that it would be done at regional level, which is fine, uh, and we emphasize that it's important that these models, all the, their assumptions should be very clear, so we can know what are their shortcomings and we know where they underestimate or overestimate certain uh, benefits. As I already said, we recommend a common discount factor to be used for all projects. And regarding uh, the approach to deal with uncertainty, we think it's uh, very important to go for a stochastic approach. And so we currently propose us to use several scenarios and to do a sensitivity analysis. Stochastic approach is still to go a step further and it's actually what some TSOs already do, are doing at the national level, so we propose that would be adopted also at EU level. And what you do in a stochastic approach is that you determine ranges of uncertainty and then do lots of scenarios across those ranges. And if we need the kind of range of uncertainty, it is actually already provided in the Energy Roadmap 2050, so that could be the starting point of this exercise. And that brings me to the Q&A, Magda. So thank you for listening, and I really look forward to this Q&A. Uh, I still take one second to do a quick uh, uh, publicity. So as you know, this is just one of the 12 uh, uh, think reports. So if you like any of these other topics, please have a look at our website. You will see that for some of these reports, we already did a webinar. I, for instance, did one on offshore grids. And who is we? He, we is this group of smiling researchers. Um, driving the report writing. Of course, we don't do this alone. We always work with uh, uh, academic experts on each of these topics, and we have been receiving a lot of feedback from an industrial council for a reality check of our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. So we can start the Q&A. Uh, however, I would like to give a little bit more time to our audience to submit their questions. So I will ask the first question. And uh, can we go back to the slide with the think recommendations? Right now, Leo, yes. was the slide okay. before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, if we could uh, right now stop a little bit um, at the point number five. So distribution of concerns should not be addressed in the calculation of net benefits. So where they should be addressed if, in, if it's not in the calculation of net benefits? Ah, okay. That's a very interesting question. So what we actually say in our report is that Cost-benefit analysis is really an economic analysis. So it would be good that when you calculate a net benefit, you are only looking at the economics of a project. But then we do agree that there might be some distributional concerns. So what do we mean with that? That I mean, fairness is an issue in European policy. So it would be good that, for instance, this process does not lead to only having EU projects of one country. That, of course, would not really be... Uh, considered as very fair. But if you look at the process um, that has been put in place by European Commission, we already have this concept of regional groups. So we will have regional lists of projects. And based on those regional lists, we will have a European list, one single European list. So you could imagine, for instance, that these distributional concerns could be taken into account at the regional level by, for instance, allocating quotas at the regional level so that each region at least has a few projects. And then we can leave it out of the calculation of the net benefits. Okay, thank you very much, Leo. So now let's go straight to the questions from our audience. The first question has a short comment in the beginning, uh, and it goes this way. The EIP states that CBA can serve for cost allocation, but the CBA results are not mandatorily used for this allocation. There is room for other ways of allocation. To what extent do you think that CBA should be mandatory for cost allocation or do you see any limitations for such use in practice? That's a very, very interesting question. Um, I mean, uh, cost allocation is probably the most uh, controversial part of this new package. And I think that has been one of the reasons that we initially did not cover it in our research to really, really first discuss about what is a good method and not enter in immediately into this topic of cost allocation. Um, actually, it's a nice question because it allows me to say that the issue of cost allocation is what Florence School of Regulation is going to work on in the coming semester. So by the end of this year, we would like to come out with our ideas on this topic. Uh, but okay, I, I won't avoid the question like this, so I will say something. Uh, I do agree that cost-benefit analysis has its limitations for sure. Uh, actually, I'm currently studying all the, the, the limitations of this approach. 
and then what we will have to do is to see how far we can use it. Uh, I, I agree, but um, the, the question could also be reversed. If we don't use cost-benefit analysis, what will we use? I mean, first to clarify is that um, even in, with this new package, the, the, the process we had before the package was that national regulators would still negotiate or discuss what could be a, f a good uh, allocation of the costs among them. This process is still exists. So what the package says is that national regulators have six months to agree and only if they do not agree or if they choose not to deal with the topic, it will go to ACER. And then ACER will decide, ba indeed based on cost-benefit analysis. So there is not necessarily a one-to-one -one relation between the analysis and what ACER will decide. But of course, uh, what else does ACER have to decide would, would be my question, uh, if it's not cost-benefit analysis. Okay, thank you, Leo. Uh, the next, next question is, does the CBA method for electricity differ from the CBA method applied to other types of project, for instance, a motorway? Would they differ from a theoretical point of view? Well, lots of these recommendations you see on this slide are not really specific for electricity. Eh? So, I mean, project interaction is always an issue. This is, data consistency is always important. The, tip, the conventional time horizon is typically a trade-off between um, the fact that these infrastructure projects, even a motorway, have long lifetime, so you need to look far in the future. But at some point in the future, the uncertainty is so big that it's not really giving interesting results anymore. So this trade-off is not necessarily specific for electricity. Um, the fact that we think it's very important to, to focus on a reduced list and that that should then be monetized is again quite general conclusion. Um, again, five would uh, apply similarly. What is maybe different is what are then these reduced list of effects that we should focus on. So this, I guess, will be different for motorways than for electricity. Uh, remember that, uh, okay, our research focused on electricity, but inside this package, there will be also a method developed for gas and one for smart grids. For smart grids, the GRC, Joint Research Center, has already been working on a different method. Uh, why is the method different for smart grids? Well, there we are more talking about innovation. So there, innovation is really important. So it suggests that you, you might need a different approach. Um, I can continue by saying that uh, it, it's always important to disaggregate information, depending. Um, and then, yeah, the model, again, this is a quite uh, general conclusion that the model should be explicitly stated. Also for motorways, there is no perfect model. Um, yeah, so some, some of it is quite general here, uh, but then, of course, we discuss what it implies for electricity. Okay, thank you, Leo. The next question, is the project financiability and project investment feasibilities included in the CBS? And if yes, then how? Uh, no, I think the idea of the package is that these are two different issues. So to apply for EU funding um, is a separate process than to become a project of common interest. So being a project of common interest does not imply that you, you will receive uh, EU funding, EU support. While I think it's not necessarily excluded that a project that is not a PCI could get some EU support. But this uh, I would have to check. But if you look, I mean, it's called a package. So it, there are even two different uh, regulations. The regulation on the Connecting Europe facility, and we have this regulation where everything I have discussed now has been uh, written down. So I have to, to say answer that there were many questions uh, regarding to, the time horizon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry, I yes, just wanted to say, to, to, to conclude, they are really two different uh, issues, yes. Um, like I said, there were many questions regarding the time horizon, and one of the first questions was, why is 2025 years taken to be conventional time horizon? Yeah, so we did look at uh, um, books about cost-benefit analysis. We did look at the practice at EU level in other sectors. And indeed, what NCOE also proposes, it's always around 2025. And it's always because you want to make a trade-off between the lifetime of these projects and uncertainty. So at some point, things are simply too uncertain to, to come up with a reasonable quantification or monetization. 
Okay, thank you. And now is the next question is regarding the recommendation number one, and is what do you mean with project interaction, and especially with taken into account? Okay, <laughs> yes, that's a very good point. Of course, this recommendation is not clear, and in the report you will see that there is a full paragraph devoted to it. Um, so let me say um, that first, what we mean with project interaction is that in theory you could have projects that uh, compete, that are completely independent, or that are complementary. Now, in, that's in theory. In practice, you will see that in electricity everything is interconnected, so really independent projects do not exist. So the question is, how complementary are they, or how competitive are they? Now, taking into account means, two different, means something different for complementary projects as for competitive projects. First, complementary. So for complementary, what we think is that they should be defined as a single project. Indeed, if you really have two projects that should be together, they should not be analyzed separately. They should simply be proposed as a, simple, as a single project. So that's what we mean with taking into account for competitive projects, uh, for complementary. Then for competitive, what we mean is that um, you cannot deal with it in the project definition. We will have competing alternative projects being proposed as candidates before becoming a PCI. And the issue is that we are not doing a planning exercise here. The PCI process is really individual analysis of individual projects. Then how to deal with competing projects? Well, we can deal with it in the baseline definition. So we can have and we can analyze each project against two baselines. One without all the candidate PCI projects and one with. And if there is a difference, um, we will know that there is a competing project because the competing project will score worse in the baseline, including its competitive project, of course. Okay, thank you, Leo. I think that we'll have time for two more questions. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and the next question will be, how is quality and security of supply taken into account in the criteria and how is it monetized? Ah, ooh, that's also a big topic. So, um, so maybe we'll have time only for one question. <laughs> no, 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 no. I would like to take both because the, the questions are really, really good, actually. So I, I'm okay to even continue beyond 20 minutes. So, well, security of supply is, 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 a, is a word that means different things, no? But one of the important things we discussed about uh, security of supply in the report is the issue of uh, lost load. So, if you look at the multi-criteria analysis of NCOE, this is one of the elements they would prefer to quantify. So, if an infrastructure project reduces the lost load, this will be quantified as an indicator, while we would prefer that it would be monetized. But to monetize, you need to agree on a value of lost load. And we do agree with NCOE that this uh, value is not yet available in all countries. But regulators have already come up with guidelines to make such a reference value. And also, we could have a, a value that is decided upon as part of the um, data uh, that will anyway we need to agree on. So there will be a process at some point uh, that we first agree on a data set to be used in the analysis. And this uh, discussion could include the discussion on what could be a good uh, value of lost load. Okay, so let's try with uh, another question. And maybe we'll have time also for another one. Let's see. Um, so the question is, regarding the discount factor, what is the suggestion? Is it a risk-free discount rate? Ah, <laughs> again, uh, a, a very important and difficult discussion. So here we really, I mean, we, we only, what we did in the report you will see is that we discuss the implications of using different discount factors. So we do not take a strong position on whether the discount factor that will be agreed upon will, should be low, uh, taking in, not taking into account this kind of, of, of risk, or should take into account more risk, and so we will have a higher discount factor. We simply discuss that it has different implications. And I mean, it's from economic theory, it's not obvious which is best. That's why we think that what is important is that we agree. There is some, again, 
this agreeing on this discount factor should be part of a data consistency and quality process, as we already have in the context of the 10-year network development plan for other uh, parameters. Okay, thank you, Leo. Uh, are you ready for another question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Shoot. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is actually also very interesting. So, uh, if you prioritize in terms of net benefit, it would favor bigger projects over smaller, even though the cost to benefit radio may favor the smaller. Should the ranking not favor the project that benefit the most with the least? Aha, that's another thing. Uh, this actually we didn't discuss because, again, it's one of those things that it's not obvious uh, what is the best to choose. Uh, but, I mean, the, the, the practice until now has been not to correct for this. Huh? So I think we simply went along with this thinking and we didn't get into this more, uh, uh, yeah, this, this, indeed there are other alternatives. I mean, the, it's even more, I mean, another issue is how to take into account risk. Eh? It's a very similar uh, discussion. Eh? So would we, do we need to correct for a, a project that has a certain risk profile or not? Um, as you will see, uh, we, we do think that these type of issues could be left to the regional groups. So I think what we say is that the regional groups should do an initial ranking based on the net benefit, not corrected for anything. But then there are a few issues that we might want to allow them to correct for. So if there is one project from this initial ranking that is, for instance, uh, much uh, more risky than all the other projects, we could do a, an initial ranking based on its mean value, but then we could correct for risk. And you could also envisage correcting for smallness or something like that, like this question is alluding to. Okay, thank you, Lel. So this will be the last question. I want to thank our audience very much for all the questions today. You were very active and we really appreciate uh, that. So uh, let's focus on the last question. It will be the Think Report concerns NSOE proposal. Will there be a Think Report on NSOG proposal for CBA? Ah, that would have been very interesting, yes. Um, but the way Think works is that we work for for different units inside DG Energy. So for the moment, as you can see here on this slide, we are working on two completely different topics, demand response and the role of DSO. And both of them are for um, the unit at European Commission that is working on smart grids. Um, so um, we, we, yeah, simply we are working on these other topics. Uh, and Think is also finishing, so at the end of May, which means that the, the question should be rather, is Florence School of Regulation uh, w potentially going to work on this topic? And we will see, maybe. Thank you. That's actually a very positive <laughs> summary of our today's webinar. Uh, there will be new projects coming and there will be new webinars coming as well. Um, so, uh, Leo, I would like to thank you very much for your today's presentation and for your time also during the Q&A. Thank you very much for that. It was a pleasure, and I really think we should always do longer Q&As. It was really very nice. Mm -hmm.